there's going to be some great talks this evening with really interesting people and a lot of talks about architecture. And uh, I think that it's really appropriate um, to start with a talk about urban design, about urban planning, all the things that happen in a city, including transport, in between all of the nice buildings, all of the things that happen in a city. We work with architecture, we work with architects on bids, reminding them to build the bicycle into their designs very early on, because a lot of architects uh, fail to do so, even in Scandinavia. We work with cities and governments around the world in how to become more bicycle friendly. And this really is something we see on every continent. Everybody wants to know now how to reestablish the bicycle on the urban landscape. The bicycle is back. A lot of my philosophies are based on simplicity and rationality. Um, we've been living together in cities for about 7,000 years. There's an enormous uh, knowledge and experience that we can harvest from 7,000 years of urban living, but we're failing to do it enough. For 7,000 years, the streets of our cities were the most democratic spaces in the history of Homo sapiens. Nothing beat the streets for democracy. The streets are the skeletal structure of the city organism, the blood vessels that give a city life. Nothing less than that. After 7,000 years, we made some really bad mistakes. About 100 years ago, we invented the automobile, and along with it, we invented traffic engineering. And it's really sad to think that in 100 years of traffic engineering, we have only learned one simple fact, and that is if you make more space for cars, more cars come. More space, more cars, more... It's a never-ending story. And think of the hundreds and hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of euros that we've thrown at traffic engineering and roads around the world in 100 years, and that is the only thing that we've learned, or haven't learned yet. This is just some great photos from Paris, from Robert Dono, uh, you know, 1950s, 1960s. He has a whole series of, of traffic photos, people running for their lives, and, and cyclists as well, across the boulevards of Paris. This is something, unfortunately, that we still see all around the world today. But times are changing. We see that there is a new paradigm underway. We're shifting to a new paradigm. We're thinking differently about our cities more than we have ever before. We're looking at how we can rebuild our life-sized cities, as I call it. I often just wonder, why don't we just design human streets instead of engineering them? using the, you know, the basics of, of, uh, of design, uh, design principles like you see in Danish design, rationality, anthropology at the top of the pile, please. Urbanism, a lot of these things are things that we've seen in the development of the Copenhagen that we know today. This is a short history of traffic engineering. For 7,000 years, we were very rational, a fast A to B for our primary transport forms. 1900, 1920, bicycles, public transport, we were still very rational. And then it all went wrong, really in about the 1950s. A tsunami from America washed over our cities, and we started only designing our streets for cars at the expense of everybody else who's just trying to move around the city. This was the greatest paradigm shift in the history of our cities, and it was destructive, and still is today. But this, however, is the easiest traffic planning guide you will ever see. You provide a fast A to B for the intelligent transport forms, and you make driving a car in a city difficult, more expensive, more inaccessible. All the campaigns in the world for ride a bike, it's green, it's healthy, take public transport, it's good for the planet, they mean nothing unless we do that fourth line in our cities. We know this, I call it A to Bism, and we know this, this is all that homo sapiens want. All of you just want to go fast from A to B. If you make that the bicycle, large numbers of people in a city will ride. We know this in Copenhagen because the city asks everybody every two years since 1996, what's your main reason for riding a bike? And it never, ever changes. The majority say, oh, yeah, it's quick, it's fast. Oh, you know. There's people who say, oh, it's good exercise. I can ride you know, just with my basket and my music, and I feel like I'm getting some exercise, so that's nice. 6% say it's cheap. Only 1% ride for environmental reasons, to save the planet. Infrastructure makes the bicycle the fastest transport in Copenhagen, and it, you will see 75% of the population riding all winter. We're heading into winter now, so I wanted to show you that photo. It's really nice to be in Paris, but I, this is my favorite quote, and now I'm standing in Paris and quoting your former mayor. The fact is that automobiles no longer have a place in the big cities of our time. This is a quote from, when you see people like that saying things like this, 
you know that there's a new paradigm shift underway. He's not alone. Many other mayors are starting to talk with the same kind of language. And uh, we have a reason to be optimistic. This is our baseline for the next 100, 200 years of urban planning. This is our point of departure. So, Copenhagen. 63% of the population of the city of Copenhagen ride a bicycle every day. How does this translate into other cities? What does it take to, you know, start really focusing on the bicycle as transport? First of all, we have to understand urban cycling, you know. The, in France, you have a great way of separating. There's a cyclist and then there's a bicycle user. You know, you have actually the two phrases. It's just regular people. It's not all the spandex people who want to win the Tour de France. It's just regular people moving around a city. It's also important to know it's not culture specific. This is not some weird thing that the Danish people do and the Dutch people do and all oh, those, they're so cute, that's what they do. This is actually, the bicycle was the main transport form in cities all over the world for decades until the 1950s. It was normal. This city was amazing in the 1930s and 1940s with bicycles. All the Nordic capitals, you know, Oslo, Stockholm, Helsinki, they were amazing. They, they resembled Copenhagen for the bicycle traffic. Then they made some bad mistakes and they just can't seem to get back to that place um, that other cities are, are trying to get to. So we know that, but we also know a lot of other stuff. We know we have so much knowledge and data and experience from 130 years of the bicycle as transport, 30 years, 40 years in Denmark and the Netherlands, measuring this, trying to figure out how we can improve. We know so many amazing things. We know that infrastructure is the key. There is no chicken and egg, there is infrastructure for bicycles. Simple as that. Best practice, the best way to design for bicycles was invented 100 years ago. That's where we started this journey. This is nothing new. It's interesting to think about Danish design, how we can reflect our Danish design culture in the way that our traffic planning for bicycles has ended up. Everything has been boiled down for 100 years and ended up in just four types of infrastructure for bicycles. One of these types will fit every street in Denmark, and it will fit every street in every city in the world. We've done the hard work for you. It's all proven, it's safe, it's effective, it's cost efficient. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's no need to send out French or Swedish or American traffic planners or engineers to try and figure out how to do this when best practice has been established. We know a lot of things. I could talk all night about the benefits, but we know in Denmark that for every kilometer somebody rides a bike, we earn 23 cents. Put it right in our pockets. For every kilometer driven in a car, we pay out 16 cents into a big black hole and we never see it again. We know that one kilometer of separated cycle track is paid off within five years. All of this because of the amazing health benefits of having a cycling population. This is one of the best business models you'll ever see in transport, the most cost efficient transport form in history. We know that all the people riding bikes in Copenhagen, they, they actually put 233 million euros into the public health, into the city's uh, finances every single year, just because they're riding their bike from A to B efficiently and quickly. We have to change the question. That's what we also have to do, many questions, but specifically this one. For 100 years, we've asked only one question of our traffic engineers. How many cars can we fit down this street? How can we squeeze more in? How many? Come on, more, more, more. We know that there's no answer to this question. The question that modern cities in the 21st century are asking is now, hey man, how many people can we fit down a street? Using all the forms of transport, all this cool stuff that we've invented, how many people? With urbanization, this is a very, very important question. This model on the right has 10 times the capacity for moving humans down a city street than that model on the left, the one we just inherited from a last century and didn't think about. We know about the health benefits of cycling. We know it's safe statistically. We know that the health benefits are 20 times greater than any risk. We know simply so much about it. That's my daughter, by the way. So the greatest thing about all this is very simple. It's all been invented. It's all ready to use. It's today. Start today. It's, it's off the shelf. You just go to the supermarket and, and, and take what you want. It's all right there. And regarding bicycle urbanism, I mean absolutely everything. Every technical detail about infrastructure, how wide, how, you know, the grade when you're going up hills, capacity, logistics, intermodality, maintenance, absolutely everything has been figured out for you already. 100 years ago this year, we had the first cycle track, on-street separated cycle track in Copenhagen. And since then, we've just been testing it, and we've figured out exactly how it works. 
When you have all of the, when you think you know everything, you might think, right, well, my work is done. I can go home. But no, it actually, that discipline allows you to design more freely. You get to think in different ways once you realize that you know so much. We do desire lines analyses in, uh, on, on urban intersections in Copenhagen, Amsterdam, and around the world. We use anthropology first. We have anthropologists who film intersections for 12 hours, analyze, and I'm talking in detail, how every person on a bike or a pedestrian uses that urban space. We want to find new infrastructure solutions. We don't want just the car-centric intersection. We want to think how we can redesign it. Every single moment of every day, the people of our cities are sending us secret messages about how they want to use the urban space with their desire lines. We're arrogant if we think that we know what they're going to do and if we're going to send them this way or that way. No, it's time for us to really you know, have urban democracy. The people of our cities are telling us what they want to do. We have to respect that, we have to observe it, and we have to plan accordingly. When you have this freedom to design based on this discipline and you know everything about bicycle parking, 100, 100 years of bicycle parking, you know, this is our idea for uh, bicycle parking behind Copenhagen Central Station, 7,500 parking spots. Um, it, makes, it makes it much easier to think you know, in these terms. Or this is our idea for cargo bike logistics. Cargo bikes, tripoteurs, right? Car using the rivers and the harbors of our cities as, as transport corridors like we used to. Having depots where cargo bikes come down and pick up all these packages that we're buying online and delivering them to the neighborhoods. Getting the delivery vans and the trucks out of our cities. Using the waterways. And this is, it also allows you to focus on specific problems. And in Copenhagen, we have 40,000 cargo bikes. This is our SUV, right? And we've designed cargo bike parking for people on street, convenient, safe, and secure. And uh, th you know, this, this is the freedom to design. We have a big problem with climate change in Copenhagen and Denmark. We have rain like never before. There's flooding every couple of years. So we think, why not be rational? Why not use the space underneath the cycle tracks for stormwater runoff? It will also create the best bicycle track surface ever. So it has a, it's a win-win situation. Et toi, Paris, qu'est-ce qui se passe? All right. You guys are doing a lot of amazing things. There were no bicycles in Paris in 2005. They were gone. And now we see a, a massive transformation, thanks to Bertrand de Lenoy and also uh, the, the current mayor, Hildago. But the mayor, she said she wants to be the best bicycle city by 2020. And I would love for that to happen. I ha want nothing more for, than that for Paris. But it's not going to happen. It's simply not possible. Not with the current level of knowledge about bicycle infrastructure uh, in, the, in French traffic engineering and planning. There's some good examples in Paris. I have this photo. This is best practice infrastructure right there, but it's about 300 meters long, and that's, then it stops. Then you end up in a weird bus lane on Rue de Montparnasse. So you know people know how to do it. But then in Paris, there's this amazing arrogance of space. Not just the boulevards, but I'm talking about the intersections. This is a photo I took from the Eiffel Tower. Um, one of the busiest intersections for pedestrians on the planet with all those tourists, right? And look at the arrogance of space. We, we, we put a filter on this, and we just look at what space is allocated to who. And here you can just see there's a huge ocean of red laughing at us. We divide it up. How many humans are actually using that red space in their vehicles on the right? There's only 23 humans using all of that red space. And, you know, there's 20, 26 or whatever pedestrians clustered together on that little island, right? We need a reallocation of our urban space, a re-democratization of our intersections and streets. This is what it would look like if you asked me. This is how we would design this inter in intersection based on best practice. It's all very simple. This took us, like, about half an hour to do the drawings, and then we did the visualization. That is what that intersection should look like. And we freestyled a bit with, uh, with the, the pedestrian crossings there. Paris is going to arrive when they recognize that best practice exists, and they can save money by using it. And you will arrive when, you see, when I see the Champs-Élysées with best practice infrastructure from top to bottom, absolutely everything that has been invented put into place on your most iconic and amazing street. That is when Paris is really going to take it seriously. The transformation of this city is underway, but this is one of the last things that you need in this city. It's all there. It's all ready to use. Start today. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, Michael. Je pense que ça va susciter aussi beaucoup de, de réflexions et de débats.